Well, hello again, everybody. You made it back once again to the Square the Circle music channel. I am your host, Aaron Major, and you're here in the greater part of central western Oregon. And it's a sunny afternoon on this uh, beautiful May day. Um, I hope everybody's enjoying their existence, and I hope everyone's getting a chance to spin some records this afternoon. And um, that's what we talk about here on the Square the Circle record channel, music channel. We talk about music appreciation. We talk about, you know, collecting records and what you should do with them, how you should file them, how you should clean them. <laughs> Not really. I mean, I, you know, I don't get that anal retentive about things, but I get kind of opinionated. It gets kind of fun. So sit a spell, have a, have a cold drink, and let's talk about some music, shall we? What are we going to talk about tonight, Mage? Well... Tonight, um, since I was mentioning here in Western Oregon, it's starting to really kind of pop as far as springtime goes and the temperature's getting better and the sun's coming out more often and all the animals are singing and all the, you know, flowers are blooming and it's just getting to be a much more pleasant atmosphere. <laughs> and uh, around this time of year, I start kind of reminiscing and I start kind of getting nostalgic and thinking about, you know, lifetime experiences and friendships and, you know, uh, lovers and just whatever else, you know what I mean? It's that time of year, it's spring, heavy on the spring vibes. And and so I just kind of was thinking about my timeline as a human on this planet, and uh, it's starting to elongate to a certain degree. And um, it's getting to the point now where I was kind of like thinking back into time and thinking and looking at some music, and I was just like, holy shit, these albums are turning 30 and, and 20, you know, 20, 25 year old albums, 30 year albums. And these is, this is stuff that I've been walking around with for that long. And it means so much to me and it brings back so many great feelings and so much, you know, so many great memories. And, um, so I started kind of just thinking about this and I'm like, wow, what a great chunk in time. And it was right around this time of year. It was, it was this time of year, 20 years ago, when I began my own personal endless summer, so to speak. And so I started getting nostalgic and kind of thinking way back then, summer of 2002, and what I was doing and where I was going. And and uh, yeah, I just kind of wanted to think about that and talk about that tonight. It was such an interesting and wild period in my personal life. This, like I said, the endless summer, I like to call it, because I think a lot of you folks maybe in your lifetime had to a certain degree, uh, that type of period in your life when it was just kind of just like, fuck off and who cares? And if you're lucky enough, I mean, if you're lucky enough to live in a certain type of society uh, here on this planet Earth, or if you happen to come from a certain, you know, demographic, or you happen to have skin of a different color or whatever, everyone's got a different experience and everyone's got their own unique existence. And I understand that. But, uh, you know, this was a period in time in my life in the year 2002. I was 22 years old. I had already dropped out of college twice by this period in time. I didn't know what the hell I wanted. I didn't know who the hell I was. And I didn't know where I was going. And it was, uh, it was pretty fantastic. <laughs> it was, it was a wild ride. And I had a great time and it lasted way too long <laughs> that's why i call it the endless summer you know it's just like you drop out of college for the second time and you and you you know break up with your girlfriend of a few years and you just don't know where you're going and and what's happening around you but you think you're having a good time you know you develop a couple of addictions and and uh you know luckily i didn't knock any, anyone up at that period in time in my life <laughs> that would have been Woo, that would have been too much for me. Um, but like I said, that period in time went on far too long. And um, it stretched into like, you know, well more than a decade in all reality. <laughs> like I said, developing some pretty serious, you know, uh, dependency issues and some like, you know, emotional, sociological issues and all kinds of interesting things. But um, the music was always there for me. And this was a period in time in my life when music was really important and I was really just eating it up and it really truly was the soundtrack to my existence. So I wanted to bring out some springtime feels, some, you know, like I said, the soundtrack to my existence, the soundtrack to my endless summer. Um, talking 2002, 2003, 
basically from the beginning of, you know, springtime 2002 all the way to like almost 2004 where I just literally was just like taking, you know, the the term fucking off <laughs> to a new height. Um, I'm just talking like every day, you know, down by the river, just, you know, bottle of whiskey and, um, you know, being 22 and nothing could kill you. You know what I mean? Nothing could stop you. You know, I was just like, yeah, kind of a force to be reckoned with in a lot of ways. Um, but we don't need to talk anymore about me. <laughs> Let's talk about the music I was listening to that back then and uh, how it fueled my fire and how much I love and adore and appreciate all of these selections that I'm going to talk about tonight. So um, some pretty special stuff to me in here, folks. Let's talk about me and what I like. Huh? Um, this one, of course, uh, I've mentioned millions of times, uh, integral to the person I am. Uh, it, it's in my DNA. It's part of who I am. This music has always been there for me and I've always loved it and adored it. So I'll just get the fandom out of the way real quick. You guys know how much I love and adore the band Tool. But I, um, when this was released the summer of 2001, I was on tour uh, across the United States um, doing a tour with a traveling troupe uh, of musicians called, uh, well, we were called the, the Blue Knights of Denver, Colorado. Um, but you march for an organization ultimately and you compete in an organization called the Drum, Drum Corps International or DCI. Um, I was a Denver Blue Knight 2001 and I was touring around and you know, playing and competing as a snare drummer in that drum corps that year. And so I didn't get my hands on this right away. And they were touring America that year. I didn't get to see them when they came through my hometown of Eugene, Oregon and... Um, so in subsequent years, like just following that, you know, 2002 is when I really got a chance to latch onto this and just swallow every bit and piece of it. And, um, and this, I just made this album my bitch <laughs> for, you know, that whole chunk of time. Like I said, 2002 to 2003, that whole two year span, um, this album just was like nonstop in my ears. I had never seen anybody do this. This was so cool. They had this excellent insert um, with all these really cool like plastic inlay, like overhead projector. Interesting. Oh man, they're such a fucking great band. And then, you know, decades later, they finally put out uh, an LP version of it, which is honestly like the packaging is not as cool as what I just showed you in the, the CD version, but a lot of people like this holographic, interesting, you know, flaming eye art. Uh, pretty intense on the inner <laughs> of, the, of the gatefold. Pretty awesome. But um, yeah, they made picture discs out of this, but this album is just so intense, so beautiful, so wildly introspective and spiritual to a certain degree. Um, the musicianship is far beyond, even, um, even beyond just what anyone can really do. Um, they're really, they really kind of created a style of their own, practically a genre of their own. Um, they're a immortal, immortal classic, Tools Immortal Classic from 2001, Lateralis, but this was really on, in my player from 2002 through 2003, just like... <laughs> non fucking stop uh that album means the world to me always will especially back then in my you know formative little you know 22 year old brain it was just like i was just really like um blossoming as far as you know my own personal uh experiences as a musician um i had just gone through like all kinds of really intense um you know I guess you could just say novice book learnings, you know, learning how to be a, a drummer, learning how to be a musician. It's like four years in high school, just like absorbing every tiny bit and piece you can. And then you go into college, you know, at the university level, playing with those cats and that's a whole new echelon and you absorb and take in all this as much as you can. And then you drop out of school and you do, you know, the, you know, I'm going to be a rock, rock artist or whatever, you know, and you do that for a couple of years and, and then you go back to like the, you know, the, the school of learning and, um, it's just a trip. And that 
that album was just so important to me. Like I said, integral, you know, to the fabric of uh, who I am. Um, yeah, that was a mouthful. Sorry, everybody. Love Tool. Love that album, specifically Lateralis. Um, here's another really fantastic album I've talked about before. It's got to be up there on probably one of my very, very favorite uh, hardcore slash uh, kind of punk uh, albums. This one, <laughs> I was so happy with, because I, I always loved these guys. I loved these guys in high school. Uh, I, I adored them and everything they did, but then they really um, didn't change their sound, but they were like, they were progressive. They were, if you can imagine, I don't know, I guess I shouldn't even try to marry these two words together, but they, out of all the punk rock in the world, they were truly the most progressive punk rock band. <laughs> They're a prog punk band uh, from America, um, East Bay of uh, California, I guess. What, what city areas would that be? Would that be, um, East Bay is kind of like, uh, is that like Vallejo? And what's considered East Bay, guys? Sorry, my California geography is terrible. Uh, Berkeley, right? Berkeley, East Bay, whatever, hardcore, AFI. This album, like I said, when they started fusing their sound and became a progressive punk band away from that kind of like skate rock, hardcore, um, and then started melting into just like kind of like, you know, synth, dark synth pop mixed with synth wave mixed with the misfits mixed with just still hardcore and punk as fuck way way cool this album sing the sorrow this was like non-stop for me and a couple couple selective homies like a group of my really close friends that i've known since i was a young young child you know we were just really swallowing this up like every bit and piece of it and loved the shit out of it we were not afraid to just be like, oh man, these guys are wearing capes and mascara and shit now again. And <laughs> we were about it. We were totally about it, dude. Me and homeboy Nick, Kyle. Oh man, we fucking loved the new AFI album in 2002, Sing the Sorrow, right? It was 02. Or was it like a little bit later into 03? It was. It was a little bit later into 03. So that was kind of like, you know... That just hit us, slapped us upside the head. We're just like, thank God they're they're doing so much cool progressive shit and aren't just sticking to the same old, you know, kind of gimmicky shit that a lot of, you know, hardcore and punk bands were doing in the 90s. It be kind of came, it kind of like, it, it sort of became a little bit of kind of like a caricature of itself. And in my opinion, that's just kind of what punk rock was doing. It's like, are you reliving like the 70s and 80s? Or are you doing something new? Or is it kind of just gimmicky? Like a lot of that fast skate rock, you know, no effects and fucking Blink-182 and just all that shit was so fucking lame and gimmicky. And there was so much of punk rock that I fucking just thought was atrocious. Um, it was really hard for me to latch on to a lot of that kind of stuff. So I found solace in uh, singing the sorrow. Yeah, love, love this album so much. So many good memories. Uh, which is crazy because it's like a really dark brooding. I know a lot of kids that were like in high school, you know, that are, you know, maybe five, six years younger than me that were like in high school in 2002 and how they were all that, that album just kind of like reminds them of sad times when they were just like, I hate my fucking parents and, you know, fucking chicken nuggets again for lunch Ugh, you know that's what afi kind of means to them <laughs> and to me it's just like an exultant progressive you know breakthrough into like this band continually like metamorphosizing and changing their sound and staying relevant and yeah i still love afi they're fucking magnificent so here's another piece from that era right around uh, like 2002 um, <laughs> I just like praise Jeebus, <laughs> praise Satan that these guys, uh, put out a full fledged studio album, the D motherfuckers. Yes. The D oh, I love them so much. I, of course, like everyone else, you know, first discovered them probably right around like 98, 99, um, by seeing them on HBO, seeing, you know, Jack Black and Kyle Gass and their amazingly goofy, creative, clever awesome show on HBO, a series of shorts. Um, if anyone's not familiar, like check it out. But, um, 
how happy we all were <laughs> when they set their comedy to, uh, you know, to the soundstage and recorded it all and just uh, a bunch, a bunch of tracks of just, you know, short comedy, you know, uh, a la, you know, Cheech and Chong, 1977, whatever was going on. You have like, you know, funny haha -ha track, song, funny haha -ha track, song, you know, and it's magnificent. Um, you can't, you know, nobody can argue with the sheer musicianship and, you know, pop sensibility and just catchy as fuck. Jack Black, amazing vocalist. Kyle Gass is a, you know, guitarist of the supreme degree, you know, just incredible as musicians. Then, of course, they got, you know, Dr. D Dr. G, uh, Dave Grohl to play drums on here, um, as, as well as, like, you know, a myriad of just, like, a wealth of amazing musicians. Um, fuck, I think, like, uh, Paige, uh, Paige McConnell, uh, the keyboardist from Fish, uh, does a track on here. Um, Adam, the name Adam Casper sounds really familiar. Uh, yeah, anyway, oh yeah, Ken Andrews. Ken Andrews fucking produced this album and played a bunch of guitar all over it from, you know, from the band Failure and Year of the Rabbit and whatever, tons of other stuff. Um, yeah, the album sounds magnificent and is magnificent in every way, shape, and form and just how great it felt. You know at this age to just like laugh your ass off like you just felt like these guys were for just for you they were all for you of course there's you know tens of you know 20 million people that feel that way about the d but um when i was in my ridiculously moronic 22 year old brain um i was like this was created just for me thank you <laughs> thank you jeebus Hail Satan. <laughs> Hail Satan. Um, it was created just for me and just for my friends. And we just adored every aspect. I don't know if any of you motherfuckers who were like in your early to mid 20s in this era, like you you all have this album memorized from top to bottom. I'm sure you do. <laughs> I know I still do. Oh, man, I'll still sing this like karaoke with my sister and shit. It's great. Such a magnificent album. All right, what else do I got? Oh yeah, I'll, let's let's talk about this one. I brought this up recently too. This was huge in my head that summer, 2002, uh, hanging out down on the Mackenzie Riverbank. You know, uh, anyone that knows anything about the Northwest, especially Western Oregon and the Willamette Valley, Oregon, there's a pretty famed river um, that flows from the Cascade Mountain Range all the way through and down the foothills straight into the Willamette Valley here, which kind of guts uh, and cuts directly through Springfield and Eugene. There's another river from like the south, southeast, that has a couple of different forks. And that that truly, in a geographic sense, divides the two cities, Springfield and Eugene. But in the north end of town, there's a much more pristine, much more beautiful, much more grand coming directly from Snowmelt Cascade Range. It's called the Mackenzie River. And it is... I mean, it's in books and films. It's notorious for being one of the most uh, beautiful and one of the cleanest rivers in this country. Thank you very much. And it's fishing. It's steelhead fishing, uh, spring trout, um, spring salmon runs. It's just phenomenal. <laughs> it's just beautiful. Um, and shit, I totally lost my train of thought. What the fuck was I talking about? I was talking about um hanging out on the banks of the Mackenzie River as a 22 year old and just getting drunk as a skunk every single day high as a kite uh nonstop and this shit was just constantly flowing through my head i loved the fact that something that can be so simplistic and raw and organic sounding and feel so close to home and sound like all the rest of your your buddies bands and your your homie over here who's playing his guitar and just singing his songs and it it just has that feel of like you feel like this guy could be one of your best friends you know and just the really clever and poetic and goofy and creative uh songsmith that he is i'm talking about doug marsh and his project built to spill and this album came out in like 98. I didn't really catch wind of it and discover it until maybe a couple years later, late 99, early 2001. But um, this was the one that I really latched onto hard and just listened to so much. And it just kept going uh, all throughout 2002 through 2003. And this was just constantly in my player, 
keep it like a secret i built this build um the how pop savvy this piece of work is it's just so catchy so many amazing hooks such uh like i said really creative writing and poetry and really clever uh guitar riffs man like kind of classic rock guitar riffs mixed with other you know more kind of like inventive alt you know alt rock kind of what was going on alternative rock of the northwest in the 90s uh that's just really important to me uh again you know really kind of like an integral to the fabric and the making of what i like and who i am and it's really special to me uh Lots of long summer days, kicking it down at the Mackenzie River, whistling tunes by these guys. <laughs> Love the shit out of that album. Oh, kind of a more darker, kind of like, this was the album that kind of took me into the, the darker places in my life when I was, you know, like I said, I've battled with substance abuse, you know, pretty much my entire life. Um, but you know, and this this is the type of album that really kind of takes you into a little bit kind of a darker place, an introspective place, and is associated more with like kind of those, you know, the darker side things in in your life and you know, troubles with women and and just whatever else. But this one's definitely a chick album. I mean, for me, it's it's not a chick album. That's not what I meant. I wasn't being sexist. I mean, it's an album to me that is wholly representative of a woman I was with in my life in a period of time, which happened to be right when this album came out. I listened to the shit out of it. It reminds me of an ex kind of pseudo pseudo girlfriend. We were never really an established item, but I was in love with that girl and she was not in love with me. Um, and this album, like I said, is wholly representative of that feeling in time in my life. Uh, that feeling in time when you, whew, boy, you're really abusing yourself and you're really kind of, you know, treating others around you like garbage as well. You know, the type of things you do and the type of things you say. Um, yeah, kind of a trip, kind of a period of my life that is hard to reflect and, and go back and look at. But when I listen to this music, I can kind of put myself in that place and I've learned my lessons and I've, I've thought things through. <laughs> but yeah, the music is fucking whew, really incredible. This was their sophomore album, their second release, 2003, I believe. Um, but yeah, it's called The 13th Step um, by the band A Perfect Circle. Um, of course, their first album, their smash, huge hit, Mare de Nam, which kind of like, you know, just kind of like resurfaced, you know, changed the surface of like the veneer of what rock and roll was doing in the late, late 90s. Like, because a lot of it was trash, remember? <laughs> and a lot of rock and roll in the very late 90s was just god awful. It was just such a hard pill to swallow every day, all day. And these guys were such a breath of fresh air uh, as far as rock hard rock metal progressing into you know really good uh, again i could say you know kind of a progressive a progressive hard rock band um they didn't mean a lot to me and uh, especially this album Whew, can be kind of a tough listen to sometimes i'm gonna do an episode soon i think where i'm gonna like highlight all of my like my breakup albums <laughs> it'll be great you guys love that right <laughs> oh man here we go a little bit loftier kind of a poppier wonderful side this was just such a a change of pace for me in a, in a period of my life again 2002 summer down by the river uh not a care in the world in a sense um and this this music was like it made me feel that it was kind of like the wind in my hair kind of shit like i did i had long hair i had hair down on my shoulders if you can believe it <laughs> times have changed um and yeah this was just like you know cruising down the road not a care in the world kind of music that's what that the endless summer i'm talking about you know the two year long summer break that i took where it was just like fuck all i don't even care this guy was huge in the soundtrack of that brandon benson i fucking love brandon benson this album the palco um this came out like again like you know 2001 but i didn't really catch wind of it and start listening to it until a couple of my very close homies uh turned me on to this guy uh my homeboy joe love you joe mitchell um you know, he had that, EP. it wasn't an EP, it was um, just his first album. It's called One Mississippi. Joe had that 
and Joe was singing that all the time and playing his songs. And I was like, who the fuck, who is this guy? Who's Brandon Benson? And he's like, go check him out, man. You know, and um, so yeah, we would just listen to this guy fucking all the time. Love the shit out of him. Uh, this is probably, I guess his second album, kind of third. There was an EP in there somewhere, like the Metairie, the Metairie EP. And then, you know, or he did an EP with the Well-Fed, it was Brendan Benson, the, like, oh, the Well-Fed Boys. Am I thinking of someone else? I'm not thinking of, like, fucking, like, Jack Johnson or anything, am I? I don't know. Who had their, their band, their backup band was called the Well-Fed Boys? I don't remember. I think it was Brendan Benson, but I think this was basically his second full-length album. Yeah, 2001. On the Start Time label. Yeah, don't ever recall any other music being released on that label, but, um... This one's just fantastic. Like I said, pop sensibility coming out of his ass, man. This guy can write a tune. Uh, a lot of great tunes. A really, really incredible songsmith. Um, plays all the fucking instruments. I mean, not specifically on his albums. I'm sure you know he hires the musicians and has the backup band, I think. He called them the Well-Fed Boys. Um, but he himself is a multi-instrumentalist and just kind of plays it all, writes it all. His lyricism is very uh, witty, very wonderful. Um, highly recommend. If anyone, you know, if if maybe you're turned off by the stuff he did with Jack White in the Raconteurs and kind of found it a little bit kind of kitschy and not really your style, um, maybe head toward like the the far other end of it and check out his like really poppy stuff <laughs> his not so kind of like hard rock americana blues stuff that he did with jack white and the raconteur is more of just like straight up pop rock you know for 20 year old girls boo, wee -oo, wee -oo. really great shit yeah it's really fantastic <laughs> all right we're just burning through them uh, going back into the realm of the heavy uh, really fantastic group that I was listening to a lot that summer. A little bit later, like in 2003, uh, me and homie Nick, we were driving around in my buddy Dan's Pathfinder. <laughs> I had a friend, and I still have a friend. Love you, Dan Barman. Shout out. If you're still in Brooklyn, man, I got to go visit you. I got I haven't seen you for a decade, man. And i that's a reason for me to get out to see New York City. So um, love you, Dan. Dan, that summer March drum corps again, and when he was marching corps, he, he, he was living in Eugene, and he said, hey, man, like, you know, take take my car and just drive it around once a week, you know, and, and keep some gas in it and just, you know, take good care of it and, you know, don't fucking crash it. <laughs> you know, so I took Dan's Pathfinder, and I didn't have a car at that period in time, so it was nice having a car. And I kind of abused his trust uh, to a certain degree. I'm sorry, Dan, I love you. Um, but I did take your car, you know, camping, and I, I, I took girls driving around in your car, and uh, I didn't hurt it, so I made sure it was full of gas when I picked you up that year. But anyway, me and Nick would cruise around on the Pathfinder, and we would spin this fucking album, Ghost Rides Cobra Sunrise. This came out in, like, I think it was 02, wasn't it, Nick? 2003, maybe. Um, but we were loving, loving this, that new kind of, like, uh, kind of groundbreaking desert rock, but still more kind of hard, like, hardcore desert rock lots of cool scream and you know screams and effects and lots of guitars on this there's fucking six guys in the band um but yeah if you love everything about like you know the deftones and and will haven and and um you know all that stuff uh you'll love the shit out of this so everybody check this out this was kind of like a lot of a lot of hard rock and, and metal and stuff I was listening to was kind of more of like the classic sense or like alt rock of the, you know, mid nineties. And I, I was still like, I was kind of just listening to some more kind of, I guess you could say tame, some tame rock. Um, not of really a lot of like hardcore fuck you in the face type of rock. Well, my buddy, Nick Phillips, Nick Phillips loves hardcore fuck you in the face rock <laughs> and still does and always did. And so he was the one that was always introducing me to heavy shit. <laughs> so thank you, Nick. I love you. Uh, not just for this band, but for like dozens of excellent albums that you've, uh, that you've thrown on me in the last 30 years that we've been friends, my friend. Um, but yeah, dude, this album, Cobra Sunrise, by the band Ghost Ride. Um, just imagine, like, a way hardcore, cooler version of The Misfits. Yes. And more metal than punk. 
So yeah, everybody check that album out. Okay, guys, get into rambling, but I'm just talking about some of my very, very favorites here. Stuff that reminds me of a really great period in time in my life, what I like to call my own personal endless summer, which was like, you know, a magnificent two-year period from like 2002 to 2003, four-ish, uh, where I was just fucking off, and it was fantastic. Yeah, I had a job. I was like serving tables uh, all throughout 02 and 03. Uh, serving tables at a restaurant, a chain restaurant called Caro's, which doesn't really exist anymore, I don't think. At least not in Oregon. Um, but yeah, I had already dropped out of college for the second time. I was like, I'm not going to do that ever again. I ended up going back uh, like a decade later. But <laughs> um, yeah, and so it's just like I had enough money to pay rent. That's all I needed, you know, and beer money. And every now and again, you know, you buy some music. When this shit hit, the world, uh, this, like, again, you know, in, in retrospect, you look back at these bands and you're like, man, this was truly like some crazy progressive shit. Like I really wasn't a prog back when I was in my early twenties. <laughs> I didn't even know what true prog was, um, back then. But to me, this stuff was like, yeah, this is, this is prog rock, man. This is insane. These guys are new and, you know, clever, intelligent crazy just like on the edge of everything i've never heard anything anything like this like i was just talking about with ghost ride you know that hard shit like i i was you know i was not exposed to that except for a select few friends that i had that just was like throwing this in my face like you've got to check this out you know and homeboy kenley kenley comes up to me and he's like you gotta listen to this band aaron you gotta listen to this band these guys are in fucking tense beautiful Love the shit out of them, especially this album, De Lost in the Comatorium by the Mars Volta. Um, yeah, like I said, had never heard anything, anything like this. I was still just kind of like living in, in, you know, that land of just kind of like really worshiping like, you know, Radiohead and Tool and Pearl Jam and, and whatever else, you know, I was in a huge Dave Matthews band phase, like in late 2000 or excuse me, early 2000s late 90s early 2000s i was still kind of like holding on even though they're they're like late 90s shit fucking sucked i was like real trying to like stay on this shit but like hearing stuff like this in 2002 i was just like it it made my fucking brain like blow up <laughs> i couldn't believe what i was hearing i was like people can play music like this and like it's like pseudo intelligible and it all comes back together like right on the downbeat when it's supposed to, even though it doesn't, it doesn't sound like it's going to. <laughs> like, incredible, like, time signatures and fast, f ferocious, just, like, the feros ferocity? Is that, am I saying that word right? Ferocity? Oh, this music, ferociousness. The ferociousness nature of this uh, music just, like, it fucking floored me. I was like, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. When I, the first song I ever heard by him, you know, that, uh, Inertiatic ESP song. Oh, geez. I'm not going to sing along, guys. <laughs> but that, I mean, that's what that song does. It's just like so operatic and killer and just like it makes you just want to sing along with it. How you can't sing like that guy, though. What's his name? I can never remember his name. Is, is uh, Omar Rodriguez Lopez? Is he the singer? Yeah, whatever, dude. Hadn't ever really heard anyone sing like that, you know, that crazy other otherworldly operatic hardcore. I mean, I, I, I heard at the drive-in, I had listened to like at the at the drive-in was at the drive-in. And then he, uh, the guitar player and the singer went off to form Mars Volta. Right. And then the other guitar player formed Sparta. Right. I love fucking Sparta. I saw Sparta live. Uh, another interesting story there. Um but yeah, this fucking band. <laughs> I just could not believe. Could not believe what I was hearing the first time I heard this shit in 2002. Whew. Yeah, I'll shut up about that. Well, and since I mentioned it already, uh, this was just kind of me hanging on to high school and the, the fun-loving, like, uh, new, ingenuitive, interesting style of music that I, I had never really heard before and it was, it was so fascinating to me it was fascinating when i was a teenager in high school um 
and it maintained that feeling of fascination and that just kind of like new interesting feeling um it maintained that all the way up until like you know late 90s and then i just got a little bit it got a little bit tired in my opinion and i, I guess i just got bored with it they were still making killer music in all reality they truly were um i was just becoming uninterested so it was just like you know a six-year phase and then this album came out and i was like ah, i can get back into this i really dig it it felt a little bit um it just felt different it felt new um it felt seasoned and a little more mature than the stuff they were doing in the late 90s but um i kind of i kind of still like busted stuff by dave matthews band uh, i think busted stuff is pretty dope <laughs> um i would say actually that this is a really fantastic album for anyone that's again you know kind of been a fence sitter uh, about dave matthews band for a long time because they've been around for fucking ever um but i mean i wouldn't bother checking anything out beyond this album honestly just speaking honestly in my opinion everything after this album is just kind of like really not you don't need to bother because then they just kind of became in themselves kind of a greatest hits band they were just a touring monster one of the largest grossing bands of all time when i'm talking about like the fucking rolling stones and tom petty and motherfucking all that they are they're up there because they have been absolute monsters of touring ever since they began Ever since they hit the fucking ground running in 1993 uh, with their first pseudo, you know, first release, uh, that LP, the Remember Two Things album, you know, it was like 92 or 93, like they have been unstoppable. They're constantly on the road. They're just on the road. And then they go into the studio directly from the road and they sell all their merch and they go back on the road. And it's like, it's insane. Uh, they are so fucking rich. <laughs> but... Blah, 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 blah. They have a ton of albums, even after this one. None of them are uh, very good, in my opinion. Uh, this one's pretty fantastic. Uh, before this, they had maybe one or two late 90s. What was it, like 90, 98 or 99 was Every Day. Um, not so great. It was a Steve Lillywhite produced album. So it sounded beautiful. Um, but the tracks were, you know, they fell short, in my opinion. Um... Was there one right before that? Um, or was it just before these crowded streets that was right before that in 97, 96, 97, whatever. Those albums are fantastic. Um, little bit of a dropping off point in the mid to late nineties. And then a little bit of a redeeming album, 2003, I think they did this one. God, it's so hard to see in CDs. Um, yeah, gotta be either 2002 or 2003, but uh, everyone was annoyed to death by me enjoying this. <laughs> so I was always putting it on in the car that we were in or at, you know, you know, in the, the home I was living with friends or whatever. People hated the, every single one of my friends. All of them. Everybody hated Dave Matthews Band, except for my friend Nick uh, respects bits and pieces of their career, his career specifically. Um, I think he's made mention that even another buddy of mine, Zach, uh, Zach kind of liked these guys, you know, but homeboy Carter Buford, definitely one of my very favorite drummers, if not one of the greatest rock drummers of all time. No diggity. So whatever, dude, Dave Matthews is fucking great. There's just really only a select few albums that I really, really dig. Uh, this one was one of them. That was kind of the end. The end of my loving relationship with Dave Matthews Band was right there. Busted Stuff, 2002. Pretty cool album. Another one of those that was really popular in the in the early 2000s to mid-2000s because of the advent of um, affordable manufacturing of DVD technology. You know, of course, I know it existed but well prior to that, but it became affordable and could be in everybody's homes for a modest price uh, right then and there around like, 2002, 2003, 2004. So you got to see a lot of bands starting to release their new album with a companion DVD. So that was one of those, tons of those in that era, which was really fucking great for us music appreciators that come from, you know, Boomer and Generation X, where it's like you're only used to just like very basic physical format media. You have vinyl cassette and you have now CDs. Um, and then suddenly when we're all getting older and you're like, what? You know, I'm paying 15 bucks and I get all this really great material? Fucking cool. You mean I can just press a button and it goes directly to a chapter on this screen? Like what? 
<laughs> I don't know about you guys, but I remember being really fucking impressed with DVD technology <laughs> when it first, like I said, when it first became affordable for someone who, like me, at, at age 22, 23, when you could barely afford to keep yourself drunk, you know, <laughs> like you could afford to go and get yourself a, a DVD player. Wow. <laughs> Amazing technology. Now we're like launching rockets with our cell phones and shit. <laughs> Whatever. Um, all right, I'll quit babbling, guys. Here's a few more really important albums that I love from that era. Uh, another one from 2003 that just like whew, fucking rewrote my book. <laughs> it slapped me upside the head. This album, um, I wouldn't go as far as to say it's underrated. Um, it just doesn't really ever get talked about in such high esteem. Um, as the rest of their, I mean, not the rest, but many other of their albums. And this one, I feel, is just one of their very greatest. I'm going to do a, um, a ranking video, very likely, of uh, these guys because they're in my top seven greatest bands of all time. They always have been, ever since 1995. They've been there for me. Um, and this truly, like I said, is a little bit more of kind of an unsung uh, masterpiece, in my opinion. But, yeah. Hail to the Thief, 2003, uh, by Radiohead. It, dude, <laughs> this album is a monster. It fucking slaps so hard. So fucking hard. Um, I just, yeah. My jaw fucking hit the floor when 2 plus 2 always makes a 5. Do, do, do. Man, that song is so fucking stand up, sit down, sail to the moon. Oh, man. We suck young blood. <laughs> so, there's so many great songs. It's a double disc. Um, a true double disc, like it's intended to be. Um, there's a lot of material on this album. Drunken punch up at a wedding, yeah. I've got myxomatosis. You should put me down. <laughs> oh, scatterbrain, a wonderful, you know, kind of a pseudo ballad there toward the end of the album. Oh man, and then that crazy, weird, like haunting kind of lullaby type of weird. The wolf, wolf at the door song calls me on the phone, tells me all the ways that he's gonna mess me up, still could kill all my children if I don't pay the ransom. <laughs> this album, oh, unbeatable, so fucking underrated. People who are Radiohead fans or people who do videos on YouTube or whatever need to talk about this album more. Maybe I'll even do a full-on review of this album and I'll just sing you guys every single song. <laughs> I'm kidding. I would never do that to you guys. I love you too much. I think at this period of time, it came out late 03 maybe, I had just given up. I had hit rock bottom. I mean, not really. I didn't hit rock bottom until my early 30s uh, as far as we've talked about my issues with substance abuse but um this was already like i was already showing signs of just like severe depression severe alcoholism and other <laughs> you know experimenting with other very dangerous drugs um but this was my jam and i would just i think i was at this point i think i was sleeping in my van <laughs> not necessarily down by the river which i probably should have been because i was troubling my my parents. I was troubling my folks and I was like sleeping in their fucking driveway in a Chevy Astro van, you know, decked out <laughs> shag carpet and bucket seats in my, in my Chevy Astro van. And me and Nick would just like sing these songs and learn how to play these songs on the guitar. And oh man, it was great. Me and Kenley out back in the in the shed out in my parents' backyard, drinking a full bottle of Johnny Walker Black Label and just getting disgusting drunk in the basement listening to this album. <laughs> it's horrible, but great. <laughs> great times, great times. Good times, the good times are killing me. Um, not quite. That, that was a little bit later. That was what, like 04, 05? But this was like... This one was lingering heavy with me. It was, I I was really loving, of course, Moon in Antarctica, but this was my first real um, 
Diving into Modest Mouse. This was the first album of theirs I ever bought. This was, I think, kind of a companion EP that was released alongside of the um, Moon in Antarctica 2001 by Modest Mouse. But this, this one is just, like I said, an EP uh, called Everywhere and his nasty parlor tricks. And I love the selection of tunes on this album. Uh, I won't say more. I just, I really like it. It's, it's really short and sweet. Uh, it's perfect. Eight songs you know, maybe roughly eight songs, a few of them instrumentals. Uh, one of them is kind of a shortened version, uh, kind of a, not a radio version, but I guess it could be construed as a radio version of the song I Came As A Rat, which appeared on the Moon in Antarctica album. Uh, but yeah, lots of really, really cool fucking songs. The um, Night on the Sun is uh probably credited as being one of their longest songs ever it's almost eight minutes can you imagine a, a modest mouse song is almost eight minutes long <laughs> pretty incredible uh track one on side two the air that song a really fucking great song the willful sp uh, suspension of disbelief is the opening track to this album just really magnificent um isaac brock eric judy jeremiah green at their very best as a trio of just really cool weirdo you know alt rock crazies it's just kind of like music for weirdos from the northwest <laughs> and that's what i was and that's how i felt especially in 2002 just felt like a weirdo uh because i was <laughs> and i felt this album represented me really well it's a really great album guys check it out all right well thanks for letting me ramble at you guys tonight um here's the last one i'm going to talk about just because um, this was the introductory album for me to these guys. Um, I, again, feel that they're a really underrated and really truly progressive group. I'm not going to go as far as to say they're prog rock, but, you know, those people that call, you know, certain groups prog adjacents, like, um, you know, Frank Zappa and the Mothers, you know, really, they're, they're prog as fuck. <laughs> and uh, these guys are really kind of the more modern, I wouldn't say modern day, but the contemporary you know, version, like the 90s version of what Zappa and the Mothers were doing. Um, I truly feel that way, and I truly feel they're uh, really progressive. I had just discovered them uh, that summer. This album was released in 1998, but I didn't discover them until summer of 2002 uh, with a bunch of my homies. And of course, again, just like kind of my love for the Dave Matthews band, uh, here was another one that just made my entire group of friends all just cringe and throw shit at me. <laughs> we're so sick of me and my infatuation with this band it was a new infatuation i had never really listened to these guys and everyone had already been enjoying them for well over a decade and they had a really just like crazy fan base and just you know the, the festival people and just the stupid hippie motherfuckers and i just i shouldn't have been into this band i was like why why do i like this band so fucking much i just i still can barely explain why i do um but this was my this was my you know my entry my entry exam into the world of <laughs> Fish, uh, The Story of the Ghost. Really good one as an introductory album. So if anyone, again, is a bit of a fence sitter or just never have been sure, just kind of always cringed, uh, give it another shot. Give, give, it, give it a quick walkthrough. And even just the opening track. After the opening track, if you're not into it, you you'll, you don't, even, don't really go much further. Uh, the opening track is the title track, Story of the Ghost. Um... And it fucking, it's so groovy. And the production is so amazing. I think actually this might even be another Steve Lillywhite um, produced album. I think he did the engineering on this maybe. I know he did some of Fish's work earlier on. Like he didn't he, didn't he master or even record everything on um, Billy Breathes? 96, 96's Billy Breathes. Or maybe that was 94. Whatever. This one, again, I think I said it was like 98 that they released this. Um, yeah, 1998. Didn't come across it for a few years after that, and I was just hooked. Fucking hooked, man. This is a heavy album. It's pretty heavy. Um, it's beautiful, you know? Gaiuti is one of those songs that it'll chase everyone away. <laughs> and it'll, it's, it's the deciding factor. It's like, are you a fish fan or not? If you can sit through Gaiuti and you love Gaiuti, you're you're truly you're meant you're meant to be a fish fan. Um, anyone else, if you can sit there and Gaiuti, um, either you get mixed feelings or you you know you absolutely it's like nails to a chalkboard. Yeah, don't ever don't even bother. 
Don't bother anything else <laughs> of their discography and their career. Um, the track Limb by Limb is the one that sold me. First time I heard Limb by Limb, I was like, what? Coming from a drummer's perspective too, that insane like Mickey Hart inspired, like chopped up weirdo, you know, it, I mean, I guess I could liken it to like what Bill Bruford was trying to do uh, throughout most of his career, and that's be creative and ingenuitive, but often just fell flat on his fucking face. Anyway, John Fishman, uh, just an absolutely amazing, stellar drummer. And like I said, he's pulling bits and pieces from those kind of odd weirdo guys that Zappa had in his band and Mickey Hart, you know, from the Grateful Dead and stuff like that. You hear that type of drumming that's just like, it's so beyond ingenuitive. Like to try to sit down and learn these beats, I, I know, learning John Fishman's beats was, it was a challenge. It turned me into a better drummer. John Fishman made me a better drummer by learning how to play the tracks on this album, you know? Yeah. A tribute track to you know the track Robert and Brian uh, it's a tribute track to um, uh, Brian Eno and Robert Fripp um, really beautiful uh, 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 what am I trying to say <laughs> instrumental sorry <laughs> beautiful instrumental um, yeah waiting in the velvet sea another beautiful song the mama dance the mama dance yeah dude <laughs> story of the ghost by fish uh if you guys aren't sure about it this is a great place to start like i said try it out give it a give it a try okay well i rambled for like an hour straight guys thank you very much for listening and going down this little rabbit hole of a journey with me all the way back 20 years to late springtime of 2002 uh here we are 2022 and uh I think tomorrow I'm going to go put my feet in the river. Maybe even take my fishing pole with me. Yeah. Maybe I'll take my earbuds down there and put in some tunes and relive some good memories. Throw some stones down the stream. So, um, that's all I got for you. Signing off from uh, the Square of the Circle music channel here in Western Oregon. Uh, don't forget to brush your teeth tonight. All right? Peace be with you.